Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Shiv and today we're going to be doing episode two of bird photography. Now if you missed the first episode, I'll put a link to it uh, in the show notes below and you're most welcome to watch that. It's preferable you watch that before you watch this episode uh, because it's a precursor to what I'm going to be talking about. So what we're going to really discuss today is um, a set of topics starting with camera settings, uh, how to get tack sharp images, focusing, using the flash, uh, what are the best conditions for bird photography, and then how to position yourself to get uh, the best images. Uh, lastly, we'll just talk about where all you can go to get some decent bird fo photographs. And finally, uh, one of the most important topics in uh, creating any kind of uh, images of birds, wildlife, is to get a good story. And in order to get a good story, you need to understand bird behavior. So that's going to be the last thing we'll talk about and uh, cover it with a number of images depicting uh, what kind of stories are achievable. So um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this particular uh, slide. If you want a copy of this, uh, do subscribe, leave me a comment and I will and with your email or you can email me and I'll send you a copy. There's a lot over here, but the key things that uh, I'd like you to take away from this particular slide is that it's best to always shoot in RAW. Uh, use a high burst rate because you don't want to miss the opportunity of uh, any kind of bird activity. Uh, typically, you want to have uh, as much of the processing of the camera eliminated so that uh, you get the fastest speeds possible. So in order to do that, make sure that, uh, you know, post capture preview and review and all of that has just been turned off. And uh, keep your live view at the highest rate because you want to, if you are going to be using live view, uh, get a good understanding of what the uh, image is going to be. Now we are outside and uh, you know, one of the things that uh, hopefully uh, I'm hoping is that there's not going to be too much background noise. But uh, here's an example of you know, a bird which is on a stick and a bird on a stick is really not the most interesting type of image to capture. But in this case, what we have is a tricolored heron in full breeding plumage and as you can see, the color of the eye is pretty intense red. Uh, the color of the beak is blue. And what I like is the blue against a much deeper blue sky. Uh, so even though, yes, it is a bird on a stick, it's an interesting uh, image capture. Now, the other thing you're always going to try and look for is to get as much feather detail as possible, uh, which is what you get here. And then in the cedar wax wing, once again, you know, make sure that you capture the most significant parts that define the bird. Now, had I taken a front image of this bird, uh, one would have missed the fact that the tail has a yellow edge, uh, the ends of the wings have a significant amount of red in them, and all would, we would have is a buff-colored chest with the face, but no real identifying features that are so important with a creature like this. Uh, here's a lilac breasted roller. Uh, again, all three images that you've seen so far are nothing more than a bird on a stick. Uh, but here again, we want to get a good catch light in the eye. Uh, you want to good, get good feather detail. And more importantly, you want to capture the colors as they are uh, in reality. You don't want to have nature images where the color looks uh, modified or adjusted to a point where the naturalness of the bird has gone. So what are the main issues that we typically end up with? Uh, one of the th biggest factors in any kind of nature and wildlife photography, particularly with birds, is that your images are soft. Now remember, birds fly very fast. I mean, 20 to 40 miles per hour and some faster speeds even for hawks, falcons, osprey. 
uh, particularly when they close their wings to dive into water. I mean, the, the speed of the bird is tremendous. Um, again, look at the uh, speed of the wings of a hummingbird or a sunbird, uh, incredibly fast. So in all of these cases, I think shutter speed is of the essence. And uh, my recommendation is if you have one one thousandth of a second, uh, you'll be fine in most cases, unless uh, the bird is diving or uh, one of the smaller birds that have a tremendous amount of wing speed. Uh, then you need to get up to at least one two thousand five hundred, one three thousand, three thousand two hundred, etc. Um, typically birds are not going to be that close to you unless you're looking to do some portraiture. So uh, the further the bird is away, the depth of field does not play that much of a role. Yes, it is uh, going to come into effect for wingspans that are large. But typically, if you have an aperture between 5.6 to f8, for larger birds, that will also be fine. So you want uh, open uh, apertures to be able to get higher shutter speeds at the lowest ISO. And if not, then uh, you are going to have to up your ISO uh, and you may end up sacrificing for some noise, but you know, I'd, I'd much rather get a good image with a little bit of noise that I can work in and uh, get solved in post-processing. Here's an example of uh, a tern. This was captured in Iceland, uh, extremely fast moving birds. And you want to get uh, a story, you want to get the turn calling, you want to get some good effect on the wings, you want to get some good light. And uh, if you look carefully, there's even some catch light in the eyes and that's what we're looking for. Here's another bird in flight, it's a red-shouldered hawk with some nesting material. Again, you're looking for story. Um, again, catch light in the eye uh, makes for some really interesting uh, images. Without the catch light, uh, the subject will look uh, just ordinary and uh, you won't notice the bird as much. So for your camera settings, uh, try shooting in manual mode. That's my preferred way because you have a lot more control. Um, you can really uh, understand what kind of exposure there's going to be well before you even start shooting. Um, and if there is any variation because of clouds or because of the, the way the light is changing, um, you can very quickly compensate for that. Uh, set your shutter speed to 1 2500th a second to be safe. You can adjust it up or down based upon what the subject is that you're shooting. And then, um, in my opinion, you can either set your ISO to um, get the right exposure or put your um, ISO into auto ISO mode and then use your plus or minus exposure compensation to make any modifications. But if you start playing around with your aperture, you may end up with birds that are not uh, well focused end to end. If you drop your shutter speed, you may get a lot of uh, motion blur and that's not something that we want. So you would always want to be sure of what's the speed and not lose any of your focus. Now in each of these cases, uh, I highly recommend that you use your histogram to look at your exposure. Uh, don't just rely on a visual, look at the histogram. And if you are shooting in RAW, then definitely uh, shift your histogram as far to the right as possible without clipping. You want to prevent any clipping, get maximum detail in the highlights. And if you are going to shoot to the right, you will also get a considerable amount of detail in the shadows. If there is some loss of detail in RAW, you can always recover that. But if you blow your highlights, there's no way you're going to get those highlights back. Uh, keep your exposure blinkies on. It does help for a quick review, but um, always it's the histogram that's going to tell you what's going on. And uh, you know, I'll do a subsequent uh, episode on actually you know, setting the right exposure uh, where uh, you should actually look at the exposure for uh, all the individual channels, the red, green, and blue channels, uh, making sure that uh, even though your uh, overall luminosity uh, may be okay as far as a histogram is concerned, a single channel clipping will cause additional problems. So once again, uh, you know, we want uh, good exposure. You want good exposure on the whites. 
Uh, the white detail is very, very important. Here you've got two northern gannets uh, doing a uh, mating routine called billing and the detail in the feathers is really what we're looking for. Now these birds are white uh, so you need to adjust your exposure to get all of that detail. Uh, notice the ends of the feathers are very dark and yet there is enough detail in them to show the definition of the individual feathers. As far as focusing, uh, typically all long uh, focal range lenses, whether they be zoom or even uh, fixed focus prime lenses, have ranges on the body of the lens that you can set. So my recommendation to you is if you are using a lens that has ranges, evaluate the distance of where you are compared to where your subject is and set the range so that it fits within the uh, area that you want to focus on. What this will do is it will allow the lens to focus much quicker and the likelihood of you losing your subject just because the lens was still focusing while you were trying to capture the image gets minimized. As far as the focus area is concerned, uh, to the most part try and use the center point pinpoint and adjust it upwards uh, because of the head of the bird being higher than the central part of the frame. Um, if the bird is going to fly, uh, you know, prepare for it, be uh, set up so that you can very quickly move the focus point left or right based upon the direction the bird is going to move. And you can pretty quickly establish that by observing what the bird typically does. And keep the focus point on the head of the bird uh, trying to focus on the eye is not that easy because birds' eyes are very small. But if you focus on the head and you have decent depth of field, in the most part you will get very good images and they will be in sharp focus. Now if you are going to be doing a lot of birds in flight, then I would recommend that you set some custom areas, uh, you know, a vertical focusing area to the left, or a vertical focusing area to the right. So as the bird comes into the frame, uh, you'll be able to easily follow it and be able to capture it. As far as uh, cameras that have uh, excellent tracking capability, uh, practice, use that and you'll be surprised how well you'll be able to uh, manage getting images of birds in flight. One of the things that uh, I do recommend is to use your um, multi-area or large area focusing system uh, to be in what I call standby mode. If you're not sure as to what's going to happen, uh, you're not sure whether the bird's going to fly or some birds are going to come in and land. Uh, conversely, if you are uh, going to be shooting birds that have a lot of erratic movement, then it's best to have uh, multi-area focus points available uh, so that you'll still be able to capture what the bird is doing. In this example, uh, there's an osprey, and if uh, the osprey was not going to uh, have, you know, this kind of a contrast as far as the background is concerned, uh, focusing would be uh, pretty easy, but the color of the clouds, the color of the wings does make it more difficult. Uh, in this particular case, I was using a custom area focus to be able to get the focus area lined up uh, against the head. And if you notice, there is a slight amount of out of focus area on the ends of the wings. Some of it is motion blur, some of it is just a wee bit of out of focus because of the depth of field. But it's not bad because it does show motion and motion should be depicted with a little bit of movement. Uh, in this particular case, I was in fact in multi-area mode. I wasn't sure when this bird was going to take off. Um, I was ready for it because I was cognizant of the direction of the wind. I knew it was going to go from left to right. So I just kept the uh, multi-area focus point available. And as soon as the bird took off, I took a series of shots. And uh, this is the one that I decided to keep. Uh, here's an example again, um, being ready for uh, action to happen. Uh, the sandhill crane, I knew that, you know, it was getting evening, the cranes were going to come in to roost um, and I wanted to get one with its wings open while it was landing and uh, you know, here again, keeping multi-area is a good thing to do. 
Let's get on to with using artificial light, uh, using flash for uh, bird photography. There's really two ways you can use your flash. One, uh, to use it as your main light, and the other one is to use it as a fill light. Uh, my preference is to use the flash as a fill light uh, because in the most part what you want is you know natural uh, surroundings, nat natural light, um, and, and a little bit of fill just to get a catch light in the eye is not a bad thing. But to artificially light your subject does in fact, in my opinion, go contrary to some of the nature guidelines where you want everything to be and look natural. If you are going to use your flash as a main light, uh, use it to freeze extremely fast motion. Uh, you know, things like hummingbirds, you can set up a series of flashes to capture their wings. Um, creating low-key images where you use your flash primarily to light your subject and the ambient light basically stays uh, on the lower side, keeping the background dark. But to make the background completely black uh, would again be a bit of an issue because that would depict a nocturnal bird and a lot of these birds that are photographed with uh, full flash as the main light are not nocturnal, so that's not what you want to show. So show your surroundings that are dark or near black, but not completely black. And if the background is close, then you'll have less of a problem, but again, it may become a distraction. But definitely uh, use your flash uh, judiciously if you are using it as a main light. When you're filling in with flash, now this is a, a whole different uh, ball game. You want to set your exposure for the ambient light because that's really where uh, all the light is going to come from. And for your flash settings, if you can use the guidelines that are shown here, and once again, uh, if you send me an email, I will send you a copy of this slide, uh, which will help you setting up uh, for fill flash and the better you know, issues that, uh, the less issues that you have with uh, fill flash, the better your images are going to look. So the key here is do not ever use your fill flash to try and make your subject all well lit up. That's not what it is for. Uh, you should never make your images look as though a flash was obviously used because that's not going to help uh, in any kind of a nature competition if you're entering it or if you are basically submitting your images for magazines or any articles. Uh, here's an example where I've used uh, fill flash uh, just to fill in the shadows. The uh, reddish egret is doing its uh, fishing routine where it picks its wings up to shade the water in front of it, uh, uses that to uh, you know, push its head down and grab the thing. Now, the head was in complete shadow. Had I not used a little fill flash, uh, it would more have been a dark shadow silhouette type image. And that's not something that one is really looking for. And then you kind of wonder why the background is so bright, yet the head is so dark. Uh, let's get to uh, the kind of conditions that you are looking for when you go out for bird photography. For birds in flight, uh, typically um, the morning hours are a beautiful time. You want the winds from the south or where the winds are a little easterly. Uh, they'll be flying and landing into the wind and the sun will be behind your back and that's really where you get the best images. In the most part, anytime you are doing bird photography, you want detail in the feathers, you want detail in the wings. Uh, keep the sun to your back, keep your shadow pointed to where your subject is and you will definitely get far better images than trying to shoot with the sun to your front. On uh, sunny afternoons, winds from the south or a westerly component are ideal and this will help you a lot, particularly if you have large birds flying, coming into land or uh, just flying across. Uh, pelicans are an ideal kind of bird for this type of uh, sunny afternoon photography. For landing shots, uh, big birds in particular look for very strong southeast winds in the morning or strong southwest winds. 
the stronger the winds, the more interesting your images are going to be because uh, the birds, when they come into land, spread their wings out and they'll kind of float down onto the water and uh, you can get some very interesting wing formations and wing positions when you do this. Uh, when you are uh, photographing large birds, again, use your uh, you know, multi-shot, uh, multi-frame images because each image will depict the bird in a different position and then you can pick out the best ones that uh, suit what you're trying to do. Uh, here in this case is another example of uh, being prepared, knowing the direction of the wind and waiting for the bird to come into land. Uh, roseate spoonbill, uh, wings beautifully spread out uh, and also make sure that uh, you, you know, are keeping a watchful eye on your exposure because most birds have a bit of white in them. White feathers are typical in the majority of bird species and that's where people get into trouble because the white will blow. Uh, don't just uh, sh look for adults, uh, look for interesting markings on juveniles. Uh, here's a African fish eagle, a juvenile, um, learning how to fly and fish. And, uh, you know, it makes for uh, some very interesting images. Now, the water is not blue because uh, it's a muddy river. And this is the Mara, and the image was captured soon after a river crossing of wildebeest. Again, a very, very difficult kind of exposure. You've got a very dark bird, the Seninga male, uh, flying against a bright blue sky. Uh, typically, if you are not careful, uh, the bird will go completely black and you will have no detail whatsoever. Uh, this is a good example of where exposure compensation using auto ISO works the best. Here again, a totally white bird against a darkish background, uh, blue skies, uh, exposure compensation will help. If you were to just spot meter this bird, then the bird would be way, way too dark. Uh, even if you were to use center weighting, you would end up with problems because of the coloration of the feathers. Let's look at some examples of uh, what you can do during the early hours of sunrise or pre-dawn, uh, light, sunset, uh, where you have a lot of backlight and in conditions where there's mist. Uh, makes for some absolutely phenomenal images. If you do ever go to Bosque del Apache, uh, look for the, in, the sort of mist conditions and uh, based upon the uh, cool temperatures, you will get a lot of mist and when the sun shines, the mist really lights up and give you uh, kinds of images like you see over here. Uh, a bit of light coming through the wings of the uh, geese uh, just adds to the story. Here again, you've got the water completely lit up, a beautiful orange. And if you don't have patience, you'll walk away with this image and if you have a little patience, then you could get an image like this. This one goose took off and I just panned with it. Uh, remember the light conditions are low. Uh, you have, you know, high sort of ISOs and you need to have a pretty decent shutter speed. So be mindful of that. You don't want too much noise and your image to get ruined as a result. Um, sunset and night kind of close to nighttime shots. Uh, typically you'll find pelicans coming back after they've been fishing at a time when the sun has pretty much gone down and you can get some really nice silhouettes of uh, any kind of large birds in flight. That's what you're trying to do. We're going to talk about uh, a topic that becomes extremely important, particularly if you have short lenses, uh, focal lengths that are less than 200 millimeters or even 200 to 400 millimeters, and you have birds in an elevated position, either on a perch or on a branch or whatever. Um, if you have a long lens, your uh, angle of declination will be very shallow. So if you have a lens pointed just above the horizon, you have actually no angle of declination, and that becomes 
perfect. But as the subject goes higher and the more you point your lens upward, that angle starts making your subject look very different and very awkward. And the tendency of people to point their lenses straight up and shoot will give you the image that you might be looking for, but once you actually review the image, you'll never be happy with it. So if you have a situation like that, the further you move away from the subject, you will reduce your angle of declination and you'll start getting much better images. In this particular case, I find that even though I did move back, I still feel that this roseate spoonbill on this snag is uh, being photographed down up and looks a little awkward, even though I've got the eye in sharp focus, but the overall image does not look as nice as it would be had the angle of declination been shorter or, or smaller. Uh, in this particular case, the angle of declination is less and the bird looks as though it was close to or not exactly at eye level. Uh, it is a little up, but far better than the example in the previous image. Here again, uh, shooting upwards, you're looking at the bird from a very low angle. You can get away with this, but again, the preference would be if you could get up higher um, or the bird would be lower, then your likelihood of getting an image that is more appealing is far greater. So if your subject is too close, focal length is not long, you will have what I call awkward looking images. Some more examples. What about the opposite, shooting low? If you're going to shoot low, you want to shoot as much as possible at eye level. Eye level of your subject is what we want to do. So my uh, suggestion is, you know, get something like a waterproof bean bag, uh, get a platypod max, get a towel. Um, always, I, I always carry a painter's brush so that I can brush the sand off. Um, a garbage bag or two and, and old clothes that you don't mind trashing if they get ruined. Um, it's important that you have your camera level uh, because you'll be struggling with corrections in post-processing afterwards. And so once you find your subject, uh, then you get down and shoot. And, you know, really there are two ways of doing this. Uh, the first one is, you know, take your lens and camera, put it inside a garbage bag, crawl on the ground, get close enough. Um, you know, don't make any sort of rapid movements because you will flush the birds. Uh, and you want to crawl directly towards the birds. Don't try and zigzag your way there. There's no point doing that. In fact, it gets even more confusing um, when you're doing that because your intent is uh, really to get to the birds as close as possible and as quick as possible. Uh, when you're about 20 feet away, uh, remove the gear from your garbage bag and then get it all mounted. Um, put it on the bean bag, level your camera and enjoy shooting. Now, I use the uh, Platypod Max and let me just show you what I have is, I've got the Max and I'm going to switch back to that view. The, the Max is right here and I have a really right stuff BH55 ball head with a Wimbley um, half gimbal or a gimbal, full gimbal if you have one, you can mount it on this. And this gives me the ability to actually move and turn the camera in any direction I want. And it is extremely low to the ground. Now, definitely, if you have a bean bag, you can get a little lower, but the maneuverability of your camera and your gear gets grossly diminished. And you don't want that. You want to have all the flexibility that you want. And you want to be able to, you know, put your camera lens up if you see something flying or if something is on the uh, at ground level and then it takes off you want to be able to follow it and then you know shoot upwards with a bean bag that becomes a big problem and so you know you want to avoid using a bean bag uh, if you have a platypod there are other devices uh, that uh, you know companies have made they look like frying pans uh, they're good uh, but i think from a bulk point of view uh, there's nothing to beat the flatness of 
the platypod. The uh, next option is, again, if you're using a tripod and you want to shoot low, um, get a tripod that doesn't have a center column. Every time uh, you have a tripod with a center column, the ability to get it pretty flat on the ground is, is not feasible. So uh, use tripods that don't have a center column or remove the center column if you can. Uh, spread the tripod legs out just as much as you need. And in most cases, what I've found is that keep your tripod legs closed um, and then you know, spread them out. And that's more than sufficient to even support a 500 on or a 600 millimeter lens. Uh, keeping the tripod the way it is with your camera mounted on it, uh, you know, put it in front of you and then crawl towards your subject. Uh, once again, as I said, keep your hands clean, keep your camera equipment clean. A uh, painter's brush in your back pocket is always very, very helpful and will allow you to brush off any of the sand that gets onto uh, you know, either your tripod or your camera. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a camera that has a tilting screen or a pop-up uh, viewfinder like some of the Panasonic cameras have, uh, you can get these really low to the ground and uh, they make for some incredible images. Uh, just be cognizant of the fact that you don't want to sit this camera on sand or, or uh, you know, ocean water uh, because the corrosive nature of salt is uh, going to really destroy your camera. But uh, put it on a plastic sheet or an old garbage bag and, and you'll be fine. Um, you can make some absolutely phenomenal images uh, with uh, equipment like this. Uh, this is, uh, you know, an example of what you get with low-lying shots. I mean, uh, you know, your background gets uh, blown away and uh, you have your subject well-framed. You have the foreground. In this particular case, it is a little bit more in focus than one would typically would like uh, to see. But uh, here's another one uh, taken in a similar location. Always looking for good detail in the feathers, uh, catch light in the eye, uh, that is most important. Again, shooting at eye level, it doesn't have to be always low to the ground, but if you can, try and set yourself up that you are going to be able to shoot at eye level. Um, get up high if you need to, uh, you know, put your tripod on top of the roof of your uh, car if you have to uh, increase your height. Um, I have many a time when I've gone out doing any kind of photography, I keep a four-foot uh, stepladder, in, an aluminum stepladder in the trunk of my car, and I can always use that uh, if I need to get more elevation. Uh, similarly, a tripod which has uh, you know, legs that can really extend out uh, will help a lot, and any uh, articulating screen camera will give you the advantage of being able to set the camera up high, uh, yet be able to view your subject without actually climbing up on anything. Here are some examples of uh, shooting at eye level. Roseate spoonbills, uh, again in courtship, in full breeding plumage. A very tight close-up of a cormorant, uh, get the detail in the head feathers, the, the beak, the eye. Uh, it makes for some very interesting uh, capture. Here again, uh, this was a lilac-breasted roller sitting on this acacia tree. And um, I actually, uh, this was in the uh, northern Tanzania. And I got up on uh, top of the Jeep and you know, set up. Uh, I was hand-holding the camera, but I was able to stand up on the, the hood of the Jeep and get myself elevated to capture this image. Uh, here again, uh, going down low, even though these birds are just phenomenal, if you want to capture them uh, pointing, as it is called, the sky pointing, and get their eyes, uh, you have to position yourself to be able to shoot at eye level. In this particular case, uh, this was in uh, Merritt Island. Um, I did, in fact, uh, climb up on top of my rental car's uh, roof 
uh, to level myself to get this image. Here again, uh, I climbed up a wall and uh, was able to get a good shot with the eye at eye level. So what kind of light should one uh, be looking for when we're photographing birds? Uh, typically, front lighting is uh, the best for birds. I mean, the, what I mean by that is if your shadow can point to the bird, then you will get a good shot, you will get good detail, uh, you won't get any extraneous shadows. And if you work off the angle so that your shadow does not appear, you'll be, you'll be doing just fine. Um, I'm actually outdoors uh, recording all this and think that my neighbors have decided to make some, some noise, but uh, hopefully uh, that's not too obtrusive. When shadows are cast by the bird, the shadow will be behind the bird and will not affect what it is that you're shooting. Uh, very similar to when you're shooting in a studio, you want the shadow to fall away from the subject and that's what we're really uh, looking for over here. Um, side lid birds do at times have too many distracting shadows, so you want to really try and avoid that. Uh, a 45 degree angle is okay, but if you're getting to 90 degrees, you're going to see some problems. Unless, of course, you want to do silhouettes and then, uh, you know, backlit situations and silhouettes, that's a whole different light angle situation. And it really depends upon what it is that you're trying to achieve uh, with those photographs. Um, shooting at the plane of the subject. I mean, these birds, if they are stationary or even if they are flying, as long as you can get yourself positioned in the plane where your camera sensor is in the same plane as the subject, uh, you will have much better depth of field control, you will have much better uh, orientation of the way your image is so that you will get more detail and you will be able to see head to tail uh, in about the same line and in about the same focus. Uh, birds in flight, if you have lots of birds in flight, it's much easier to shoot and get them all in focus if they're flying across rather than them flying towards you where the birds at the back will either in, end up being in focus or out of focus. Again, uh, using plane of the subject as your, if you want birds to be in pretty much a good depth of field, uh, you know, the, the bird is angled towards the film plane, it's not completely in plane, but if your depth of field is good, then you can further extend it and get not just the bird, but some activity uh, in and around the bird too. Here again, pelicans are large birds, and if you want the head and the body to be in good focus, then you want to shoot uh, pretty much in the plane of your camera sensor. This is a good example of where light falling at 90 degrees will cause problems. Notice how beautifully the back is lit, the exposure is fine, but the front of the bird is in shadow. Here again, uh, plane of the subject. This is more of a 45 degree angle, not bad. It gives the bird a lot of depth, and which is nice in certain cases, but may not be as good as if the angle had been closer to about 20 or 30 degrees, then you would have seen much more uh, and, and far less shadow. Finally, let's uh, talk about uh, birds in flight and wing position. You must always work the wing position in your images. You want full up strokes, you want full down strokes. A flat w uh, stroke where the wings are perfectly horizontal will not necessarily make for good images. This is a, a low-flying roseate spoonbill which I've taken from uh, the embankment and you can see a number of other shorebirds uh, just out of focus behind the roseate. So it is very low coming straight at me and the wings are in the upward position. Conversely, the same bird, the next wing stroke being completely down. 
Uh, once again, motion being depicted at the end of the wings. However, the head, eyes, and the body of the bird are perfectly sharp, and there's no uh, motion blur. Here again, uh, you know, a great egret in flight, uh, inbreeding plumage. As you can see, the light is just gorgeous. It is from back above, and uh, the shadows will be representative of that. But, but here again, I mean, you want to capture the bird with its wings in a good position. Um, bird about to take off, even here it's important. I mean, if the bird was just with the wings closed down, uh, it would have very little impact compared to with its wings fully up just before it, it takes off. So where do you go for birds? Um, you know, knowing where to find birds is kind of critical. They are accustomed in certain cases to the presence of people and in those locations they are the easiest to photograph. Um, I'm here in my backyard and I am looking at, you know, a number of birds that, uh, you know, come to my feeders, I have uh, you know, little twigs and branches and snags uh, for them to uh, sit on before they go to the feeder and uh, give me a great opportunity to shoot. I'd shown you some of this earlier. Um, you know, I get woodpeckers, I get uh, all kinds of nuthatches and other birds. Uh, strategically placed feeders, you know, suet feeders, wild bird seeds and platform feeders work great. And definitely don't forget uh, to put out some drinking water for them where they can also bathe. And, you know, that uh, makes for uh, a very attractive place for birds to come. There are uh, a number of books that you can use uh, for you know what to give and how to feed birds. Um, use any one of these as a uh, guide to help you build up your feeding stations uh, in your backyard or front yard, wherever you have the opportunity. Again, knowing where to go, um, city, state, national parks are great places. Zoos are excellent, despite the fact that we have uh, still this pandemic and the uh, you know lack of ability to travel as much as one would like to. Um, the other places that you can go uh, once things open up is bird rehabilitation facilities, uh, rescue centers, and then finally the wildlife refuges. I mean there's you know 450 odd locations where uh, there is some tremendous bird photography. I mean uh, America is blessed with uh, such a vast variety of uh, bird species and whether you're in the north, south, east or west there's always birds of different kinds. Uh, what you get in the east you may not get in the west and vice versa but uh, get yourself some uh, good bird behavior books and observe behavior, anticipate action. Uh, as I say if you are prepared you're going to get a good shot. If you're really really uh, looking for making amazing images, I said, you know, be prepared for the unexpected and things will happen. Uh, look for behavior like, uh, you know, calling, singing, preening, ruffling of feathers and so, so much. Uh, nest building is always uh, a fabulous way because a lot of repetition takes place. Uh, you'll find, you know, the bird bring twigs to the nest, fly off, come back and typically they'll fly to the same location and come back in the same direction. So that anticipation of where to you know, shoot a flying bird coming in uh, gets diminished. You are able to actually set up and as long as you're prepared you'll get the shots. Um, there are a few excellent books on bird behavior and uh, you know a guide to birding basics and that will work for photography it's not just for birders because learning bird behavior will help you set up and capture great images and I want to basically uh, come to a close with a few examples of bird behavior images. Uh, a blackbird, red-winged blackbird on a, uh, a cattail uh, singing beautiful light, you want catch light in the eyes, you want ruffled feathers, and you want detail. A uh, marsh wren, uh, again on cattails, singing away to glory. Um, background again is important, uh, you know, as far as you can, you know, 
blur it out, get the right depth of field, and you'll make some wonderful images. A uh, round-headed pelican, again in breeding plumage. You want feather detail. This was shot a little downwards, looking down at the bird, but still the background is not obtrusive. A northern gannet uh, coming into land. Uh, 60,000 breeding, breeding pairs of uh, northern gannet in, uh, per se, Quebec. Um, capture a bird with its wings outstretched like this uh, makes, you know, for, for wonderful images. And just be prepared because this is how they come into land. And they'll land in a spot that you wouldn't believe uh, even existed with the number of birds that are on the ground. Uh, razor bills, uh, again, uh, courtship behavior, billing. Uh, up on the rocks, as uh, you can see all the guana, this is really where they are, so you can set up and be prepared for some action. Uh, here's another northern gannet, uh, behavior so typical of uh, protecting its uh, young. Uh, they'll spread their beaks out and uh, you know, stay like that for a considerable period of time. It's, I don't know what it is, but either they're shading them or shielding them, but you see this behavior a lot. Uh, fishing, feeding, uh, I was lucky to be able to capture this image, uh, both getting the osprey's eyes in sharp focus as well as the fish that it had caught. Uh, painted storks, uh, again feeding, had both legs been down, the image would not have been as interesting, but with one leg up you know that it's in motion, it's moving forward and it's going to keep its bill till it finds something and then just uh, snap it up. Uh, tossing food, another very uh, interesting uh, behavior where uh, egrets and birds that are fishing uh, on the shoreline uh, will toss their food up in the air and swallow it whole. Uh, American Avocet, Feeding, another great egret image with uh, feeding behavior. Another feeding. And then ruffling of feathers, preening. Uh, typically you find images of uh, hummingbirds, lots of hummingbirds, all with wings out in motion. But I find this image to be most interesting because of the amount of feather detail and the coloration and the fact that uh, you know it's it's uh, got its feathers so ruffled another uh, good example of uh, puffins puffins with uh, fish uh, again if both legs had been down there would have been no sense of motion but you want to get that sense of motion so one leg up makes for it uh, here, uh, great blue herons uh, nesting. A green heron, um, yes, bird on a stick, but notice the eye. Look at the intent look it's giving into the water, even though you can't see the water because it's completely blurred out. But that is depicting what it's going to be doing. It's looking down and then it's hopefully going to fish. Here's another one uh, of an osprey which uh, was able to get uh, two alewives and a sandhill crane coming in late afternoon uh, coming into roost landing just creating that right amount of splash in the water the wings beautifully spread uh, this is really what I'm looking for, and this image was captured nearly 20, sorry, 10 years ago. Uh, nesting with uh, roseate spoonbill, a good example of cropping. You don't always have to have the entire bird in your frame. As long as you capture it with intent, that means the, the framing is defined uh, basically by what it is that you want to depict without making it look as though you made a mistake. Uh, here's another uh, female um, hummingbird, it's a uh, ruby-throated hummingbird 
but here the, the tongue is uh, poking out. And that's what you want. You want some action. You want some story. Uh, European bee eater uh, feeding. It's actually a fecal sac that it picked up by mistake and it spat it out. And in this particular case, it is just a little pose. Uh, the uh, roseates, you lo notice the neck feathers, uh, it was all wet and it had been uh, fishing. And I just liked the way it popped its head up and looked directly at me uh, with those wet feathers. And then finally, it's also interesting sometimes to get not just one, but multiple species. And if there is some interaction, uh, makes for uh, some even better images. In this particular case, a juvenile uh, brown pelican uh, with a gull. Here you've got a great blue heron and a great egret uh, in conflict. A painted stork and a African fish eagle. So with that, uh, this is the end of episode two. I will be doing episode three, which will be focused more on camera settings and applicable more to the uh, Panasonic Lumix cameras. But a lot of the subject matter that I will be covering is applicable to more than just uh, the Panasonic cameras. Uh, and if you uh, would uh, like any further information on some of the earlier slides uh, that were textual, uh, please do leave me a comment below, send me an email. Um, I will definitely be uh, creating the last episode uh, in July. So with that, um, thank you very much for watching. And if you have enjoyed this, please do give me a thumbs up. Uh, if you would like to subscribe, I'd really appreciate that. And I look forward to seeing you at the next episode. Take care. Bye now.